Well, I've created over 40 videos now and over seven hours of video lessons. And what I've been trying to do is put in things that weren't really well covered in the letters, or at least as well covered as I would like, but things that I had always told them stop smoking clinics. And I need to point something out. Only three of the videos are on medical aspects, and that's representative to what I do in the stop smoking clinics. I don't spend a whole lot of time on the medical dangers of smoking. I spend the first day on it. I'm trying to help people understand the importance of quitting smoking. I always felt that if you convince a person that they can quit and you give them a technique to do it, but you don't give them a good enough reason to do it, they're not going to go through the trouble. On the same token, if you convince somebody that they have to quit, but you don't give them a technique on how to do it, they're not going to be able to pull it off either. People need to understand two things about quitting smoking, and that's how important it is to get off and how to get off. But the first day, I get that out of the way, and I tell the people I won't talk about medical issues after that unless they have questions about it. If things come up, I'll, you know, I'll address it, but it's not the primary problem being dealt with. The primary problem is the addiction. So in the seven hours, we have uh, less than an hour, I would say, at this point, on medical dangers of smoking. What I think is even more surprising, I think, to people, if they really think about it, there's really been nothing in the videos up to this point about how to quit smoking, dealing with issues like nicotine gums or patches or nicotine products or, or other prescription drugs to quit smoking. It's amazing because I really don't talk about these things in the Stop Smoking Clinic. I mean, I tell people the first day of the clinic, we're, we're a cold turkey program. And I don't really need to spend a whole lot of time explaining why we're a cold turkey program. I think most people who come in, the first day I explain, you know, quickly what the purpose of cold turkey is. It's trying to detoxify them. It's trying to get nicotine out of their system. But I don't have to spend a whole lot of time now bashing all the other things that are out there to quit smoking. I think the majority of people who come to the program realize already these things don't work. The way that I always explain it on how these things don't work is I try to get people to, again, do their own surveys. I say, go find every long-term ex-smoker you know. And I define long-term ex-smoker as a person who's been off nicotine for 365 days straight. I'm not saying how they got off nicotine. I'm just saying they've been off nicotine 365 days straight. Those are the people to now take in reference. If people talk to long-term ex-smokers they know, people who have not smoked for 365 days in a row, they're going to find, and have not used nicotine for 365 days in a row, they're going to find that the vast majority of them had quit cold turkey and, again, fit into one of the categories that I always describe. People who woke up one day, they were sick and tired of smoking, never touched one since. People who left the doctor's office, they were ultimatum, quit smoking, dropped dead, never touched one since. Or people who got sick, again, not smoking sick. They had a cold or a flu, they felt miserable, they couldn't smoke, they couldn't eat, they're down with the infection for a few days, they start to get better, the infection dissipates, and all of a sudden they realize, wow, I, I got two or three days on my belt. Let's see if I can keep it going. And they keep it going. Pretty much all the people they will encounter, for the most part, are going to fall into those categories. And the more people they talk to, the more credible this will become. That the way to quit smoking is you simply quit smoking. You do what the people who you know who quit smoking did. So I don't really spend a whole lot of time talking about all the different products out there. Because to me, it's a waste of time. It's like they're going to get all the information they're going to get anyway from, you know, from the TVs and from media. But by the time they're coming into me, my guess is they have realized already, you know, it just doesn't work. And if they don't realize it by then, by the time they go talk to everyone they know who's quit smoking, they will realize it. Sometimes somebody will be there and will push the point, at which point I do have to spend a little bit of time talking about nicotine replacement. So I'm going to kind of tell the one story that I tell, which is basically the first encounter I had with a person who used nicotine replacement products. It was amazing because I had this person in a clinic within three months of when nicotine replacement products were available in the United States. And I had a few people come into the clinic who wanted to use the product, and I always said from the beginning, no, you know, we're, we're a cold turkey program. We're trying to get nicotine out of your system. This stuff is keeping nicotine in your system. To be honest, at the time when it first came out, and we're talking about 1984, I just assumed it was going to be a passing fad. I figured people would realize what's going to happen. They're going to use this product. They're going to be addicted for a long time. In fact, the first thing I did when I knew it was being released, and I put this out the week before it was being released, 
I sent a letter out to, I think I probably had 1,500 or 2,000 people in the clinic by that point. Uh, I'm not sure the numbers. We, by the time I finished doing clinics, we had over 4,000 people on the mailing list. And I don't remember exactly where we were on a year-by-year -year basis, but at least we had 1,500 people. I shot off a letter to these people very quickly because my concern was somebody was going to offer them some of this product. People who'd been off smoking already, who were over withdrawal, and then they were going to have some well-meaning friend or neighbor who was going to say, oh, you know, if you're really having a bad time or if you're getting a thought, here, maybe take this, it'll help. And I was concerned about that. I was concerned about a relapse happening if people took this stuff. Keep in mind, I didn't address it to all these people prior to this because it wasn't available. No one knew about it. Nobody had access to it. So it wasn't a concern that I had to address. Well, now I had to address it. So the first thing I did was got off my first letter about nicotine replacement products before it was available. Well, I talked about it a little bit in some of those early clinics, but again, I didn't feel like I needed to spend a lot of time on it. I had one guy come into a clinic, and again, it was about three months after this stuff was released, and he came into the clinic touting how great nicotine replacement product was. And again, it was nicotine gum. It was the only one out at that time. He said he'd been on it for a year and a half. And whenever he got a strong urge, he hadn't smoked in a year and a half, except for about a week or two before this clinic started, and he's coming to the clinic now trying to get off smoking. But he said the, the product was great. It was great. He said he hadn't smoked in a year and a half when he had this product. Well, I couldn't figure out, well, how did you have this product? You know, it wasn't available yet. Well, we have a few military bases in the area here. Uh, we had at that time Fort Sheridan, we had Great Lakes Naval Base, and we had um, Glenview Naval Base. He worked and I think it was at Fort Sheridan that he worked with, and I'm not sure, it could have been Great Lakes Naval Base, but he worked at the Naval Base. He was a civilian contractor of some sort, but his offices were out of the base and he dealt with the military. He had access to military transport, and he was getting nicotine gum flown in through Europe. I don't even think this was legal at the time what he was doing, but this is what he did. He said this stuff was great. Whenever he had an urge, you know, he, he quit smoking a year and a half earlier, it was 18 months ago, whenever he had a real strong urge, he would just pop this gum and gosh, he got through it. And he was touting this thing at this clinic. And now it was available in the United States. And um, he, But he was coming to the clinic to quit smoking and I, I said, well, you've been, you were off a year and a half. And, you know, you, you, you're saying whenever you had a real strong urge, whenever you had a real strong urge, because this is how he said it, you just pop a stick of the gum and this would get you through the urge. You said, yeah, yeah, this was great. This was a miracle product. I said, how much of this stuff, you know, are you chewing a day? He said, well, yeah, about 12 to 18 sticks a day. Now, you know what this is telling me? I didn't tell him this, but it told me this. This is telling me that a year and a half after this guy had touched a cigarette, he had not smoked in a year and a half. He's getting 12 to 18 strong urges a day. See, that's by definition. He said when he got a strong urge, he would take the gum. And we'd get him through the urge. But when he got a strong urge, he'd take the gum. Well, this is telling me that a year and a half after this guy has touched a cigarette, he was getting 12 to 18 strong urges a day. He's calling this a great product. And I actually asked him, why are you coming to the clinic then? Well, he, his supply got cut off. He couldn't get it anymore. And then he was going to a doctor for a prescription, but then the doctor wouldn't rewrite the prescription. And that's, he, he started to ration his gum and he had to smoke around his rationing at that time. And this is when there were heavy warnings, like don't smoke when you're on the gum, you know, it'll give you a heart attack. This is what they were saying back then. And so he was rationing how he could smoke, but he still wanted this gum. So he was rationing all he can and now his supplies were off. So he had to join the clinic to quit smoking. Again, this guy didn't catch what was going on here. He was in withdrawal for a year and a half. He was, not, he was getting 12 to 18 urges a day. When you talk to people who are off smoking a year and a half, they should be going 12 to 18 days that they don't get thoughts. Every now and then they'll do something new and they'll get a thought for a cigarette. There'll be a passing thought, you know, gee, be nice to have a cigarette right now. No, it won't, you know. That, that's the thought, it, it goes through their mind. I always compare it to the urge people get to clean their homes. You know, gee, you gotta clean the house today. Yeah. Something better comes along and they'll just go do it. Well, that's what the thought for a cigarette will become over time. The regular kind of thoughts that will occur will be very irregular in frequency, and there'll be long, long time periods between those moments. Not what he was experiencing. He was getting 12 to 18 strong urges a day, a year and a half after he touched a cigarette. This is where the problem with these products are. They're keeping people addicted.
they're keeping people having to keep feeding this dependency. Now since him, I've had numerous people in smoking clinics who use these products for extended time periods. I've had people who used it for over a decade. Uh, I know one person who spent $15,000 in these products. And again, even in her case, it was the type of thing when I met her, she was explaining how oh, she still fights it every day. She still wants to smoke every day. This went on for a decade. And we hear this from people in emails too. It's infrequent, but I'll get people who use this stuff for, again, over a 10 year period and are basically never breaking free of the thought of smoking all the time or the thought of feeding an addiction all the time. It's ridiculous. There is no reason that a person should be going through weeks or months or years or decades of fighting a physical thought that would normally be gone. It'll peak in 72 hours and again in a couple of weeks they will not have physical desires for cigarettes. Yes, there will be triggers for cigarettes. Again, the first time they do new things. But as time goes on, you start running out of new things. The products that we're dealing with, they're not creating desires just around triggers. Their desires are being created because nicotine is being depleted and it has to be replenished in a regular interval where they're dealing with drug withdrawal. The easiest way to quit smoking, it really is the easiest. Everyone will tell you, oh no, it's hard. It's hard to do it this way. It is much easier to go through a few days that might be rough. And again, might be, might not be. There's people who quit cold turkey who don't have any major reaction or symptoms doing it. But let's let's give it a case that it's a worst case scenario. It's a really bad withdrawal. It's a really bad withdrawal in those cases for again, a day or two or three, and that's pretty much going to be it. As opposed to having a moderate withdrawal all the time, every day for the rest of your life if you keep delivering this product in that manner. Or if you use it the way that they're saying to use it for a three month period, but it's still the same thing. You're going through three months of a prolonged withdrawal state. Yeah, it may not be peak withdrawal, especially in the early days when you're using the highest dosage, but as that dosage gets lower and lower, well then, again, every time a person is stepping down, they're dealing with a quitting process again, or again, of getting their body adjusted to a lower level, which is the cause of discomfort, that's gonna keep going and going until they finally get this junk out of their system. Quit smoking, get nicotine out of your system. In three days, it is out of your system. It's metabolized into other chemicals, or it's excreted, one or the other. And then it's just a matter of relearning activities, doing everything you did as a smoker. The sooner you get this stuff out of your system, and the sooner you continue on with your life, and just do everything you did as a smoker without a cigarette, the sooner you will understand what it feels like to be a former smoker. And it will be a very nice way of life in contrast to what it was like to be a smoker who was constantly fighting of keeping nicotine in their system. Especially in a society where they couldn't smoke anywhere and anytime they want, which is where most people are now. Some, at some points in time, people are dealing with withdrawal on a chronic basis because they can't smoke as they need to. Quitting smoking is a short-term proposition if done correctly. Get nicotine out of your system, learn how to do everything you did as a smoker, just without a cigarette, and the sooner you do all these different activities and the sooner you get the nicotine out of your system, the sooner your life will go back to the way it should have been and should be. And, this, and you'll never have to deal with quitting again, and you'll never have to deal with withdrawal again, as long as you never put nicotine back in your system again, via any source, being whether it's nicotine gum, whether it's a patch, whether it's an inhaler, any nicotine product, as long as you don't put it in your body again, you will never be an active user again. And again, as long as you understand what tobacco products, to never chew on a tobacco product, to never put tobacco product in your mouth in any form, and then, the primary understanding is to stay free is as far as a lit tobacco product goes. This means a cigarette, a cigar, a pipe, any form of burning tobacco. To understand, the only way to keep that quit going is to never take another puff.